Welcome to Think Tech on Spectrum OC16, Hawaii's weekly newscast on things that matter to tech and to Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Keisha King. In our show this time, we'll review the most recent top five Think Tech talk shows and staff pick. We'll check out the elements of the best of the best and get a handle on the public issues and the guests involved. Our Think Tech talk show offerings are very diverse, and their coverage is also very diverse, covering things you might never have otherwise known. Every week, Think Tech chooses its top five Think Tech talk shows from the week before based on the number of views each of them has had on the Internet. For this week, the winning shows are as follows. Number one, from the series Beyond the Lines, hosted by Rusty Kamori. It was called Retired Police Chief Lee Donahue, Beyond Law Enforcement. Rusty spoke with Lee about his career as a police officer and his success as Honolulu's chief of police. Lee shared valuable insights about leadership, creating a culture of excellence, and dealing with life's challenges. Back in the early 1980s, Chief Mike Nakamura uh, sent me to Japan uh, to learn about the Koban system. Koban system is a system used by the Japanese police where they have what they call police boxes uh, strategically placed throughout the city. And they have a, a light over the station. So okay. if you see the light, you know that you can go and get help there. So we were sent to uh, study that. And these, the Japanese had done their research on me, and they knew that I was involved in the martial arts. So every station that I went to, they took me to the, the dojo, and they would put on a demonstration. You know? But I learned, I learned there that uh, the police officers, to be a police officer in Japan, to uh, graduate from the academy, you have to have your black belt in either judo or kendo by the time you graduate. So. <clears throat> With that, when they get assigned to their different stations, they would invite the kids in from the community to learn judo or, yeah. or kendo. And this was their way of, of building their rapport with the kids, uh, teaching them character, self-discipline, and as well as, as making them uh, you know, just good community members. What are some of the principles and some of the things you have the, the kids recite? We have uh, 16 bylaws in it. We, uh, uh, everyone has to recite a bylaw. And, and they're, they're simple bylaws that we live by. Um, one of them is uh, I'll, uh, never use any profane language. Yeah. And I think that's important, and we tell the kids that. As I say, if there's one thing that disturbs me is if I'm walking through a shopping center and there's a group of young people and they're using profanity and it's, it's just disturbing, you know? Yeah. So I, I would want my students to be, to be, you know, good, decent people and know the difference between right and wrong. What are, what are some of the other uh, interesting things that you have them recite on a daily basis? Well, we have uh, <clears throat> never say in one house what you hear in another. Yeah. <laughs> never speak ill of the absent. Good. You know? Never misuse these arts or yep. use them for self-gain. You know, th those are some of the real, real interesting. And uh, protect the innocent, forgive the ignorant, yeah. and tame only the wild. However, let us tame ourselves first before we tame the wild. Number two, from the series At the Crossroads, hosted by me, Keisha King, it was called Virginia Beach Mass Shooting, Connections to Hawaii and Beyond with guests Peter Carlisle and Dr. James Allen. Peter Carlisle and Dr. James Allen remembered those lost at the recent shooting in Virginia Beach. You know, we're having a tough discussion about the mass shooting that took place, place both here in Hawaii as it relates to the one in Virginia Beach, but I could also say the one in Las Vegas or the one in Miami, Florida. Like, why is this happening so often now? Well, you wonder whether or not constantly seeing this type of thing over and over again uh, has some impact. But it has to be shown over and over again uh, for reasons of security. And that's one of the things that we need to be very much aware of in terms of making sure that if we have an opportunity to keep some place more secure, that we take advantage of that. No, wait, no, I disagree. I'm hearing what you're saying, we need more security. What type of security? We cannot have security at every single job. 
And what if the security is the first person killed? I mean, you know, we screen people. I used to work as a director of human resources. We do a background check. We have these psychological tests that we have people go through to get a job, even at a, a place like retail, Ross. You have to complete a psychological te test. What more security do we need that would prevent mass murder? The, what we do in terms of security is now it's enhanced. And we make things secure by screening type methods. So we screen people as they go in and out of a courthouse. We screen people when they uh, are moving through certain areas. And we need to have those types of abilities mm -hmm. to essentially try to preclude people from committing these types of crimes. Again, I'm all over the place with that because now in Virginia Beach, we're talking about a municipal center. We're talking about an employee who has already passed every screening test to get hired in the first place. And I remember, I believe I heard a, a person who was a passerby saying that he saw the gunman walking and thought it was a part of a, an actual test or a drill. Um, I don't know, but I know in a lot of buildings in Virginia Beach, those types of government buildings, you do have security that you have to go through. There is a, a wand guy there to check you. So I don't know that that's the answer, that more security is the solution. Well, it, you have to enforce it, in other words. So you have to make sure that you're doing those things that you are supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And if you're not doing that, then you've got to get on board and do it. Number three from the series Pinoy Power Hawaii, hosted by Emmy Ortega Anderson. It was called Rice Up Farmers Pinoy Power Hawaii, with guests Princess Donato, Elvin Lacida, Joseph Duano, James Assel, and Paul Wilson. Emmy spoke with her guests about their inspiration in getting Rice Up started and why and how other Asian countries are interested in following this award-winning way of rice farming. Wow, I'm excited now. I'm so happy to be able to let the whole world know of uh, this wonderful project that you got going. So tell us about how you got started. I am from the Philippines. I was born in Manila, mm -hmm. uh, but grew up in the rural areas of Pampanga since uh, Nung bata ako, mm -hmm. na ngarap po talaga ako na mm -hmm. magkaroon ng paraan para matulungan yung ating magsasaka. So ang aking lolo po, lumaki ako sa kanya, uh -huh. ay isang magsasaka. Mm -hmm. He's a farmer. He was a farmer. And he tried his best to work hard. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, konti pa rin yung kita. The income mm -hmm. is not, uh, he doesn't get the income he deserves. Mm -hmm. As well yes. as other farmers. Mm -hmm. So... I from you had a dream. Yeah, I, start, uh -huh. I studied agriculture engineering, which is very rare in Philippines. And then nakakuha po ako ng scholarship dito sa Brigham Young University. Wow, oh, me oh, you. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, and and uh, when I came there, 2016. Nangarap po ko. Actually, mm -hmm. yung dala-dala ko lang dito sa Hawaii was, mm -hmm. was 88 pesos. So 88 pesos? Ako, <laughs> hindi ka pa magpabili ng pagkain? One oh, dollar. Wow. So, yun yung natira sa bulsa ko noon. Oh. Nagdumating po ako dito. Pero, I use that inspiration uh -huh. to not only help myself, but our people in Philippines. Oh, oh. And now, together with our team, we created uh -huh. Rise Up to innovate how mm -hmm. farmers deal with agriculture. Mm -hmm. Because we believe that agriculture can really create prosperity in our country. Wow, you've yeah. done so much with a span of not even uh, two years, yeah? Uh, Paul, well, if yes. my math is right, <laughs> but it's going three, and uh, you've uh, come a long way, and you are living, you're all living the dream. See yeah. what happens when uh, with uh, some education, a lot of passion in your heart to make a difference, and that's what's happening with you. So. I am so excited because you had just gotten back from uh, being recognized for the great deed that you have done. Yeah, a princess can talk more about mm -hmm. that uh, Enactus mm -hmm. program that we are part of. Okay, yeah. princess, you do look, <laughs> really look like a princess. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Of Aladdin. Thank you, yes. <laughs> uh, well, Enactus, it stands for Entrepreneurial Action Within Us. Mm -hmm. It's an organization that encourages universities, not only in the USA, but around the world, to 
um, be part of social entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And so just last month, we had our nationals for um, the competition here in the USA where different universities across the country mm -hmm. came, um, presented their own ideas. Mm -hmm. um, they judge us based on the impact that we've done this year. Number four, from the series Hawaii Together, hosted by Joe Kent, it was called Home Sharing Under Attack, Vacation Rentals in Hawaii, with guest Mary Lavoy. Mary explained how lawmakers' plans to crack down on vacation rentals may hurt Hawaii's economy. Joe and Mary gave an update on the status of this legislation. Should they ban the whole vacation rental industry, which would, you know, maybe create a bunch of new uh, rentals or, you know, what should no, they I do? No, that won't create a bunch of new rentals mm -hmm. because the people that still room share are still going to be there. Yeah. They don't necessarily want to share that room full time. Well, what about uh, other things? Um, you know, the uh, economic impact, and we talked a little bit about that, but I mean, getting in the weeds here. Um, you know, vacation rentals, they contribute to our economy. And uh, I mean, the, the people who visit those rentals, they go on hikes and they go to restaurants and, and so forth. I mean, um, and if, they, if we cut off the market here, then presumably that all that uh, economic activity would leave. Is that well, right? look at North Shore. Can you imagine what's going to happen to the North Shore? You know how many North Shore people have come in to testify to say, what are we going to do with all these single moms mm -hmm. that want to ha do the house cleaning and be able to pick up their child at two o'clock? Sure. They don't have the opportunity to drive into Waikiki and, you know, work a job in town. They're just going to create more traffic. They need to work right. out where they live. And these jobs provide um, an opportunity for those people to have a better quality of life. They talk about how they fix up their homes. They can pay their mortgage. They can pay their rent. Um, they're even putting some of the homeless people to work, cleaning the yards sure. and doing all kinds of stuff. So it's it's helping some of the economy, but there are people on the North Shore, and I would you know be remiss if if I didn't say that there are some people on the North Shore who don't like vacation rentals mm -hmm. and who want it, you know, just uh, you know how uh, Hawaii as if as if we had no vacation rentals. So and people say there's too many tourists here and all of that. So how would you respond to that? Well, we are a destination location. We have very little other industries other than small business, the military and tourism. So we need to embrace this travel trend because these visitors will just clearly go elsewhere. I mean, sure. in the United States, it is a $36 billion industry and growing. Mm -hmm. And this is the way the millenniums want to travel. Mm -hmm. They the want options yeah. in mm -hmm. accommodation. And if we don't offer the accommodations, uh, accommodations they'll just clearly go elsewhere. So sure. we either lose the money and uh, destroy the opportunity mm -hmm. for the revenue stream, which the revenue streams um, will afford us the opportunity to pay for that noose around our neck rail. It fixes our streets, mm -hmm. our infrastructure, our sewers, our parks, our beaches. 
all the sure. erosion that's going on around the island. But we need that money. And if we yeah. don't collect it from the tourists that are happily willing to pay it and locals that are making money that are willing to share that money, if we don't take it from them, the honest truth is they're going to have to raise everyone's property taxes. Sure. Number five from the series Hawaii State of Clean Energy, hosted by Mitch Ewan. It was called Hydrogen Endgame, the infinity fuel for a sustainable future with guest Matt Moran. The show focused on hydrogen and how it is the ultimate fuel that will ameliorate climate change. So you can look at this to size the various components in your system. Like, you know, if I have yep. this much wind or I have this much solar, you know, how much uh, hydrogen can I produce or how much can I store, you know, what size of fuel cell do I need? And, and the bottom line is, you know, what's, what's my output here? So why don't you walk, your, walk us through this uh, slide? Yes, that's, that's exactly right, Mitch. And um, yeah, so the left-hand side shows you the system model and it shows all the energy and uh, fluid flows. So as you mentioned, it, it allows you to start to size the system, to design it, to optimize it, and to simulate it. So you, you can basically do all of those upfront uh, things uh, virtually before you start to cut hardware and, and, and put the system together. And you've got a good sense of how the system's gonna operate and how to optimize it for your application. So on the far right side is, is kind of the dashboard piece of the system model. You can change the, um, the loads that you want to simulate, uh, where the power is coming from, how much. Uh, and then it's got a few graphic um, uh, snapshots of, you know, your distribution of power sources in, uh, your loads, and how much you're storing in terms of uh, excess uh, energy that you can use to create hydrogen and store it as energy and then what your uh, waste heat and uh, fluid flows are. So you've got everything kind of there in one screen to, to, to take a look at, and you can walk through uh, hours in a day or, or days in a year or what, uh, whatever combination you wish and start to really optimize the system for, for, the, uh, for whatever your application is. Right, so it's a really, really effective and useful tool for uh, system design. So yes, let's... Uh, we're hoping to... Oh, apply. sorry. Go ahead. No, that's fine. I was just going to say, we're, we're, we're beginning to apply it in, in some of the uh, uh, first in case studies and now in some of the pilot demonstrations that we're beginning to uh, get some traction on. So uh, I noticed you put up the energy target markets. Uh, if you look at those, uh, there, there's some very large markets that uh, are, are uh, we believe, are, are primed for hydrogen introduction. Some of them, uh, most of them actually already have some uh, hydrogen systems in place, but uh, there's a lot of room for both growth and improvement in the performance of those systems. So. Uh, grid and stationary storage, as you mentioned, um, being able to store some of that renewable energy when it's produced and use it when uh, when it's needed, uh, when the uh, renewable energy isn't high enough to, uh, to meet the demand. Uh, you also have microgrid and off-the-grid uh, um, situations. Again, um, uh, uh, states like Hawaii and island nations, uh, this starts to become uh, very interesting because you can start to consider um, you know, isolated systems, uh, in a sense, energy systems that are self self sustaining and secure and, and have a high resiliency. And then the final one is transportation, which actually you see quite a bit of hydrogen uh, introduction already. As you mentioned, you've got uh, cars already on the road there in Hawaii that uh, right. are driving with fuel cells and hydrogen. And our staff pick from the series at the crossroads, hosted by me, Keisha King. It was called First Time Home Buyer Education 2019 buying a home in Hawaii with guest Raina Miyamoto. Buying your first home is very exciting and a bit nerve wracking. So let's get you started on the right track with the first time home buyer education 2019. We talked about how to find a course on home ownership. The show also included many helpful hints for first time home buyers. Um, I kind of alluded to it in the home ownership coaching, but um, it really is based on household size and household income in terms mm -hmm. of qualifications. And that can be kind of a, a big range in terms of what the income is for the same household size. So um, the first thing I'll say is I think a lot of folks might write themselves off thinking I'm not going to qualify for home buyer, um, home buyer assistance programs because it's only for lower income people, et cetera. But, you know, I tell folks you should check it out because actually the options are, are varied depending on what, what's out there. Yeah. Um, you know, in terms of the Home Ownership Center, we do our best to try and uh, track who offers what type of assistance, whether it's a local bank, um, a government entity, and that sort of thing, too. So it could range from a 0% interest um, second mortgage uh, mm -hmm. in terms of an assistance. It could be 
Um, it could be a grant where they actually just give you the money and they mm -hmm. don't accept, expect anything in return, which mm -hmm. is fantastic. Those are the ones I like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Not as common. No. But yeah, that could be some of it. And some are more tax related in terms of tax credits, so it can mm -hmm. kind of vary. Okay. Now, you said over the past 10 years, how long have you all been in existence there? Mm. The Homeownership Center has been here. We're going to be 16 years old, actually, in Sweet October. 16. That's right. So, teenager. Mm -hmm. um, I've been here for 13 of the 16 years. So okay. It's been a wonderful. fun ride. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. I'm sure you've learned a lot and have seen a lot, especially with the way that the market is for home buyers at this mm -hmm. time. I know. Um, <laughs> Funny you mentioned the income and how it makes a huge difference. And most people don't think that they qualify. Some think they make too much and some think they make too little mm -hmm. to qualify for assistance. But the median income that you need to make here in Hawaii to survive puts us all in a certain bracket that we'd rather not be in at times. So I, I think it's important for people to know that everyone should at least apply if you're interested in buying a home. Mm -hmm. At least check it out. Or learn about what's available and then make a... Um, good decision because some um, some of these buyer assistance programs does do come with uh, requirements in terms of how long you live in the home and mm -hmm. those type of things. You can always find the links to these shows in our daily email advisories. If you don't already get our daily email advisories, you can sign up to get them on thinktechhawaii.com. These are only samplings from the top five and the staff pick from across our 35 weekly talk shows. There are, of course, many more. To see these top five and staff pick shows in their entirety, go to thinktechhawaii.com or youtube.com slash thinktechhawaii. Great diversity, great community, great content at ThinkTech. If you have questions or comments about these or any of our shows, please let us know. And yes, it's okay to share them with your friends and colleagues. Thanks so much for watching our shows and for supporting our efforts at ThinkTech. And now let's check out our ThinkTech schedule of events going forward. ThinkTech broadcasts its talk shows live on the internet from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. on weekdays. Then we broadcast our earlier shows all night long and on the weekends. And some people listen to them all night long and on the weekends. If you missed a show or if you want to replay or share any of our shows, they're all archived on demand on thinktechhawaii.com and YouTube. For our audio stream, go to thinktechhawaii.com audio. 
and repost all our shows as podcasts on iTunes. Visit thinktechhawaii.com for our weekly calendar and live stream and YouTube links. Or better yet, sign up on our email list and get our daily email advisories. Think Tech has a high-tech green screen studio at Pioneer Plaza. If you want to see it or be part of our live audience, or if you want to participate in our shows, contact shows at thinktechhawaii.com. If you want to pose a question or make a comment during a show, call 808-374-2014 and help us raise public awareness on ThinkTech. Go ahead, give us a thumbs up on YouTube or send us a tweet at ThinkTechHI. We'd like to know how you feel about the issues and events that affect our lives in these islands and in this country. We want to stay in touch with you and we'd like you to stay in touch with us. Let's think together. We'll be right back to wrap up this week's edition of Think Tech. But first, we want to thank our underwriters. Okay, Keisha, that wraps up this week's edition of ThinkTech. Remember, you can watch ThinkTech on Spectrum OC16 several times every week. Can't get enough of it, just like Keisha does. For additional times, check out OC16.tv. For lots more ThinkTech videos and for underwriting and sponsorship opportunities on ThinkTech, visit ThinkTechHawaii.com. Be a guest or a host, a producer or an intern, and help us reach and have an impact on Hawaii. Thanks so much for being part of our Think Tech family and for supporting our open discussion of tech, energy, diversification, and global awareness in Hawaii. And of course, the ongoing search for innovation wherever we can find it. You can watch this show throughout the week and tune in next Sunday evening for our next important Think Tech episode. I'm Jay Fidel. And I'm Keisha King. Aloha, everyone.